Thank you, Ryan, for joining. It's a pleasure having you. You were my academic advisor at Seton Hall University, so I met you my freshman year there. And I actually have a lot of memories just between you and me. I feel like you've influenced my life a lot. You actually coined the word BC. You were the first to ever call me yes. BC. You also were the one that I spoke to changing my major from business to pre-med, which eventually had to meet up with BC. Uh, I remember that conversation. And yeah, you're overall a great person. You are a former semi-professional track runner, a 400 meter sprinter and for Oregon Track Club. So that was awesome. When I first heard that, I was like, all right, I, I, I can talk to a track guy and <laughs> my advisor. Now you're a director, correct me if I'm wrong, but director of academic and student athlete support services compliance officer. That's a mouthful at NYU. NYU. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and it's it's been a ride, you know, from from going from uh, from undergrad and running track, and you know, thinking I could potentially turn it into a career, and um, then quickly realizing that would be more difficult to sustain. Uh, mm -hmm. Going back to school and going, you know, and and really finding my passion in the work that I do right now, it's uh, immensely gratifying to to see folks like yourself, Brian, doing as as well as you are, and that that's what makes the work so so meaningful. So yeah, this is was at Seton Hall for about six and a half years and now at NYU for a little over three. So the dream continues on. Nice. Yeah, time does fly. During that time, during your six years at Seton Hall, how many years of that were you working on your dissertation? Yeah, so my dissertation ran roughly um, two, two and a quarter years, I think, from start to finish um, with publishing. And if you had to line up start to finish, if I did it every day and a few hours a day, it was probably maybe six to eight months of work. Okay. So the main focus of this video will be around Ryan's PhD dissertation. I'll be talking about what Ryan found and talk about some unfair NCAA rules that were found to be hurtful, especially against HBCUs. So the name of the title is investigating equity and evaluation on the relationship of NCAA's APR metric on similarly resourced historically black and predominantly white NCAA D1 colleges and universities. So that's a mouthful. A mouthful so too. <laughs> that's another mouthful. I thought it'd be great to start off with definitions because actually yeah. I didn't know what HBCUs were until senior year of Seton Hall or maybe even after graduating. It, it, I still, I remember not knowing. I was very clueless as to what that was. So let's just define that for the audience. Yeah. So, so the HBCU was created out of necessity. Really, you're looking back into the history of American um, higher education and higher education was for for white men for a, a significant amount of time. I mean, the earliest college in the U.S. is found in the 1630s. It's not until the 1830s that colleges provided for um, for women and um, black Americans at that time. So the historically Black college and university is created a necessity for a place for uh, for Black Americans to learn. And um, the, the goal, really, if you look at the mission of the HBCU in general, it's really uh, targeted towards providing um, education for Black, uh, for black students. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of those students are first-generation college students, and a lot of those students are coming from lower socioeconomic statuses. It seems like there's a, there's a, there's a long history of HBCUs um, helping Black Americans move up in the uh, socioeconomic ladder. And, mm -hmm. and then there's also a long history with the NCAA. You cite something called an a APR metric. So APR metric stands for academic predictive... Academic progress rate. Uh, academic progress rate. Yeah. So, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, like the, the I'll, I'll kind of take a step back and, you know, like kind of going back to the historically black colleges part, when we're calling a school, they're, they're actually formal, you know, they're, they're schools like Chicago State, for instance, that predominantly provides education to black Americans, mm -hmm. but they're looking at institutions that were formed before 1964. So there's roughly 120 historically black colleges mm -hmm. in the United States today. You, you know them as Howard is probably the most recognizable one, yeah. Grambling, Morehouse, Fisk, uh, Lincoln University, because Southern Lincoln, Lincoln is a, is one of the northernmost universities, Cheney and um, outside of Philadelphia is the first, they, they center on um, 
the eastern coast of the country and either and also the southern states that border the Gulf of Mexico. So they really run all the way up to as far north as Pennsylvania. Um, Delaware has Delaware State. And then you're running all the way pretty much down into Texas. So you're really drawing that borderline along the ocean. That's where where they all reside pretty much okay. um, with a few that are kind of scattered um, in more inland a little bit. But um, yeah, so so my my focus looked at um, comparing this program. This program was actually started when I was in school. I remember it, in fact, because when I was at Rutgers, we had the first ever academic progress rate uh, for our team. And so mm -hmm. I was there. I was at Rutgers from 2002 to 2006. And the program actually was started around 2003, 2004. So the yeah. idea, the reason why the program started and the reason why it exists today it's actually part of a, a bigger umbrella called the Academic Performance Program. But essentially what it is, is it's an accountability metric, right? The idea with APR was that you, if you're looking back through the NCA's history in the terms of graduation, there are a lot of student athletes that were not getting what we would deem a meaningful education in addition to graduating, right? The ultimate goal whenever you watch an NCA uh, program is the ultimate goal is graduation, right? So what they're finding in the 80s and 90s is that a lot of students are coming forward and in, in, especially in revenue producing sports like football and basketball that are reading at a third grade level or fifth grade level or not reading at all and are being put on the court for their schools and really are functionally illiterate, mm -hmm. right? And so what's happening is the Knight Commission, there's a group called the Knight Commission that kind of like is an accountability group. I know we're gonna talk a little bit later about mm -hmm. them. Um, but they propose, hey, there needs to be something that actually holds colleges accountable. And they came up with this idea called the academic progress rate. And essentially, it's two pronged, right? So every semester, every student athlete who's on scholarship can earn two possible points. So let's say, Bryant, you're on the, the cross country team at Seton Hall, you're on scholarship. And they look at retention and they look at out and if you are eligible. Right. So if you are retained after your fall semester and if you're also eligible, there's a little bit that goes more that goes into eligibility. It's, it's usually a 2.0 minimum GPA and a certain amount of credits completed. Mm -hmm. Then you earn two points. You were two for two. You earn the retention point and you earn the eligibility point. So what they do is they take all those points over an academic year, all those and they add them up and then they divide by the total possible amount of points. So whatever that percentage ends up being dictates whether you are penalized or not. And so roughly what, what the NCA figured out is that if you had a essentially a 93 percentage of the points earned, 93 percentage or higher, that you were on track to graduate 50% or more of your student athletes. Mm -hmm. um, and what they did was it, you know, because any given year you could have an off year, they would take four years of data and combine it into one. And that average is the academic progress rate. Right. And that's where all the decision making comes off of in terms of penalties and bonuses and things like that. So yeah. that's the program in a nutshell. OK, so that's a great overview. So I have a few questions about the the two pronged um, eligibility requirements. So I know there's a 2.0 high school um, requirement and there's also a GPA requirement and the uh, standardized testing requirement. You kind of touched upon the fact that these aren't great measures for eligibility, especially that GPA one, because in certain high schools, um, it might like one high school might be easier than another high school in terms of how to get to that 2.0 GPA. And there's also issues with standardized testing itself and how and how and exactly how much does it reflect on a student's academic ability. Um, there's a lot of criticism and critics on um, standardized tests, ACT and SAT. I have a question of as to what you think. Like if you lived in the dream world between, I don't know, let's say you, you could change things up and like in terms of in terms of eligibility, how would you think it'd be better or best for NCAA schools to have athletes fulfill these requirements before they can participate in sports? So they're not so they're going to graduate so they can actually, right. you know, so they're prepared for college. Yeah. So so what you what you talked about. Brian, um, is, is initial eligibility, which is, which is a huge consideration, right? In, you know, like the NCAA has what they, you know, back in the, in the eighties, they had a bunch of different policies, um, which they looked at for, um, 
for in what we would call initial eligibility. Mm -hmm. You met this criteria, then you are immediately able to come in and participate in sport. And so like one of the, one of them that you cited was the 2.0 rule. Mm -hmm. You know, if you came from a school that was, I mean, and again, we, we know that, you know, depending on what types of resources you have, the better education you're exposed to it, not necessarily the better education you receive in high school, but at least you're exposed to. And so mm -hmm. schools in inner cities don't quite get the funding that schools in, in, um, in the suburbs get. And as a result, there's a disparity in terms of uh, preparation for college. So those policies in the past were, I think they, the NCA learned the hard way in terms of how they were, were shaping those policies. And so what they did develop was uh, the sliding scale, and they also developed for, for division one, um, which is that there's these 14 core courses that you have to get a certain amount of math credits, a certain amount of science, a certain amount of English, history, et cetera. In addition to having, a, when we call it a sliding scale, if you have a lower GPA, it means you have to have a higher SAT or ACT mm -hmm. and vice versa. If you have a higher SAT or a uh, higher GPA, you can have a lower SAT, ACT. And so that mm -hmm. was what the, the, the answer was that to try to make things more um, standardized okay. in that sense. So, you know, like if- So, if so Ryan, the sliding scale was the solution, is that? Correct, so okay. that's, that's the current solution. Right. And right. I think that's being looked at in terms of equity as well, because we're still yeah. seeing that there was an equity in terms of ability and, and preparation and how students are, are, are being prepared for the college side of, of, you know, of the schooling part of yeah. college versus the athletic side. I think we, we know that the athletic side um, is a completely different beast when it comes to preparing for it for that. Yeah. And so for me, there, there's a really, uh, really incredible book that I, I read um, called The Miseducation of the Student Athlete. It's by mm -hmm. um, Colin Williams and Kenneth Shropshire. Kenneth Shropshire is an amazing faculty member at Arizona State. Colin works for RISE um, down in Florida. But they talk about if we're talking about like a, what I would love to see is uh, there's a number of things, but one of them would be the ability for all student athletes to get what, what Colin and Kenneth identified was a meaningful education, mm -hmm. right? Because we, we look at student athletes right now and the world looks at student athletes for, um, for their potential on the field or the court or the arena of play. Mm -hmm. And that means their education gets a backseat. So, you know, a lot of these student athletes are pretty much professional athletes when they're in college, they yeah. are just taking the minimum course load to, to get on the field in order to play and when they're done, and if they don't make the, the you know professional leagues, then nobody cares about them. Like that's it. They're they're stuck with what they have. Oftentimes, it's a meaningless degree because they have nothing to show for. And um, and so I think there's a bunch of things that could be that could go into fixing college athletics. One is the money disparity is is egregious. We should not be spending uh, having coaches sign contracts that are rivaling eight figures now. Um, we mm -hmm. should not have strength and conditioning coaches making over a million dollars a year. We shouldn't have assistant coaches making seven million, you know, like seven figures. Um, and yeah, yeah. meanwhile, student athletes are not compensated fairly for the work that they do. Yeah. Um, because they are the people that generate that revenue. Without student athletes, there is no revenue. And this is a multi-billion dollar industry. I think that can't be, that can't be, um, mm -hmm sidestepped yeah, every right. year college athletics is a multi-billion dollar industry <laughs> yeah it's it's uh it's it's pretty nuts but i think in general if, if i could look at a world where i think that we would see greater equity it would look at putting the student athlete first i think if we can center our focus on the student athlete and their needs first then we're making right decisions yeah i think the priority has to be the education of the, of the student athlete that's why they're called student first the fact that the NCAA is a multi-billion dollar industry, it's just interesting because it's categorized as a nonprofit, at least that's what I read. It's just um, something that I think is kind of, we're, we're starting to see a backlash and rethinking of what it means to be an amateur for a student athlete, especially those football and basketball players that are out there bringing in that revenue. So yeah, I, this, is, this is like part of the reason why I, I really wanted to talk to you about that because I feel like you kind of were the first person I really heard discussing this in a, in a manner that brought the evidence and also was 
kind of calling out the NCAA for being so greedy or being essentially not doing the best they could for the athletes that are being essentially exploited. Yeah, it, it, so it's it's really interesting. The NCA it, it definitely is a nonprofit. They, um, I think it's something like ninety seven or ninety six percent of the revenue that they they make, and 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 the overwhelming, I think it's eighty percent of that revenue comes from March Madness. The rest of it comes from championships and and other things. And yeah, um, but that goes right back into colleges and schools. So I that, like I think there's a lot that's that's I think is misunderstood about the NCA. And I think it's very easy to paint them with a broad stroke of good or bad. Yeah. In reality, there's so much good that the NCA does, but there's also things that they have to work on. Um, they do incredible work in terms of um, in, in terms of leadership and developing young leaders for the future. They do incredible work in terms of providing scholarships. They do incredible work in terms of programming and, and development of young minds and leadership academies. And so like they have really done immensely valuable work, especially in NCAA research and understanding the student athlete better. But there are programs that are harmful and there are things and there are choices that are harmful and decisions that have been made historically that are very harmful to students. And so, you know, I, I think we have to be able to talk about the NCA, you know, in, in, in the sense of, and, and be honest and say, it needs to do better especially when you look at student athletes who are brought in on the, on the big screens, right? The people that are watching them on Saturdays and Sundays and during March, right? Those student athletes usually get the short end of the stick. I mean, they really get the short end of the stick. I mean, like when you talk about amateurism, that's one thing that we have to really wrap our heads around. Like mm -hmm. student athletes at these top universities are getting experiences and are getting opportunities that are better than professional athletes like the training facilities that they have are better than professional athlete training centers i mean yeah. you go into any one of these top universities like texas or ohio state or michigan or usc and you look at their train and university of oregon and you look at their training facilities and you match them up to you know the the seattle seahawks or like you know the, the the New York Giants like they dwarf their facilities yeah, and yeah. so I think we have to come to terms with the with with just knowing that there is the, you know like this idea of amateurism is is past right like mm -hmm. and for instance if you look at the University of uh, Alabama their football players they are spending roughly five hundred fifty thousand dollars a year per football student athlete. That's that's one yeah. year. That's the average amount that they're spending on one student athletes is about five hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Uh, this idea of amateurism is is a dated is a dated philosophy that really needs an update. And I think you're going to see that in the next two or three years with a lot of the legislation that's coming through with name, image, and likeness. Yeah, I think basically that legislation, from my understanding, is that let's say I was still an athlete, I could use my name and likeness so I can. I can say Brian Cordova is a cross country runner, start a YouTube channel, um, use that and, and not get in trouble. Like that revenue wouldn't be like, I wouldn't be sanctioned by the NCAA for doing that and using my name and likeness and making logos. Do you have anything to comment on that before I move yeah, on? Yeah, I, I, I mean, like you, you see how it, it's dated because like I work at NYU, right? You know, yeah. like we have arguably, and I'm sure there, there's elsewhere, but arguably some of the most influential actors and musicians and, and performers come out of NYU than other any other institution, yeah. maybe globally. We'll use Lady Gaga and Donald Glover, who's, who's also known as Childish Gambino, as an example. Both of them went through NYU. And so, yeah. like, you look at both of them, and while they were students there, right, there, there were no restrictions on Lady Gaga, you know, signing recording rights and yeah. and and going forth and and making money off of that there was nothing that would prevent her from doing that you know with actors that would go through like there's nothing preventing them from being a student and also at the same time benefiting off of their likeness and and we we have that in sports right now right and exactly what you said and i think there's this disillusionment that that we have to like the, the first thing that comes out of most people's mouth is we have to pay student athletes. So they're thinking that it's coming out of the bankroll of, of a college or university. Some colleges and universities, it probably will come out of at the point. Like that's just where it's going to, it's going to end. 
most of the compensation is going to happen through things like social media, through influencers, through TikTok, through Instagram, through YouTube channels, whatever it is, that's where it's going to come from. Yeah, I, for sure. That's, that's a hundred percent accurate. And I realized I may, ha- I may have re- misstated. I don't know if Donald Glover did go to NYU or not. I just realized that, uh, I just always, I see him when he's walking through yeah, really? <laughs> like Washington Square Park. He may have gone through NYU, but if I, if I mis- misstated yeah. there, I, I apologize. I think the, the example was, was noted. Yeah. <laughs> so you, we're talking about all this money, right? It's, it's just like a mystery as to how, where this money goes, where it's channeled, how it's organized. So let's say like re- the ticket revenues from a university on top of like ad sales, advertisements, whatever, all that money made from a game is sent through the NCAA and is that then, how does that then? It depends. Yeah, it's a great question, Brian. So, so revenue comes from a lot of different places. So like, let's pick a school, right? Let's pick, I'm just going to use Ohio state because we, we talked about Ohio state in the class that I was teaching recently. Ohio state has a ton of different streams of revenue, right? Mm -hmm. They'll have corporate partnerships. They'll have um, donations from alums and and what we would call boosters. Mm-hmm. Um, they have a big check that's written every year from the conference, from the from the Big Ten conference yeah. that comes from its media rights that usually is around fifty five million dollars a year. Um, they'll get money for participation in bowl games. They'll get p- money for participation in um, March Madness, and they'll get money through the conference level. Um, they'll also get money for selling merchandise. They'll get money for putting fans in seats. So there's a lot of different, and that's not all of them. I mean, these are just some of the larger streams of revenue that come into the school. So the NCA actually has very little to do with a lot of the money that comes through most schools. They do facilitate about a billion dollars a year to, to the 1,200 schools, most of them being Division One. Mm-hmm. That money that they're distributing is almost primarily through the March Madness tournament. Okay. Right. So like that 800 million that they're getting through March Madness every year, most of that money is coming back, but schools do very well in terms of generating revenue. Now how they spend it is another issue. And and that's kind of where the, the, the side that most people don't, don't know about. If you're a person that's watching this right now and you want to know where to find where the money's coming in and where it's going, go to the Knight Commission database you could pick any school, pick, pick Rutgers University, my, my alma mater, or, you know, or, or pick, a, a, you know, Oregon or wherever you'd like to. And it will break it down and show you where money is being spent. And the overwhelming majority of money is spent on administrative and coaching contracts, right? It's spent on facilities and it's also spent on travel. And so, um, And so when you actually look at the money that is generated and the money that goes out, it's only about 20% of money that goes directly to students in the form of scholarships. The rest of the money is like charter jets and hotels and Mm -hmm. expensive coaches and expensive facilities. And, you know, like that's where a lot of that money is going on an annual basis. And that's the issue is like when you're seeing, you know, like Nick Saban, who's the coach of Alabama, make $9 million a year or Coach K at Duke make $10 million a year. And meanwhile, the compensation for the student athletes that are generating that revenue for, for them. And I'm not saying that they're not they're not the best at their craft. But the money that they're generating is on the backs of students that are getting scholarships yeah. right, and are being treated in ways that kind of like dangle, you know, dangle something in front of them so they won't realize that they're really getting the the short end of the stick on it. Like Mm -hmm. nice gear or, you know, fancy meals or flying on, on jets or, you know, like, Mm -hmm. like that's where it's, and like recruiting too, like recruiting at, at Georgia was, um, they, they spent over $3 million the other year, like $3 million just on recruiting. My alma mater has, has a private helicopter that, that the head football coach can use to go recruiting. I, I mean, something. Like, like, wow. These are not normal things to be like college athletics. These are not normal things that are. Yeah, happening. right. It's it's almost like a just an elite class. You hear about helicopter pads for coaches, or just as all this spending for recruiting. It's like something that's just out of this world. Like it's just like not a lot of people know about that. Or we have like assumptions about like, oh, like all these, like all this big money is being spent on all these fancy lavish 
things. But what causes, like, what, why are coaches being paid so much? I don't, it doesn't make sense in my head why their salaries have to be ballooned so much versus, versus making more scholarship opportunities for athletes. Yeah, I, I think it's because we've let it get there. Um, and I think what happens is you have statements from the, the president of University of Alabama say things like, you know, paying Nick Saban eight or nine million dollars a year is the best investment that we ever could make because when Alabama does well, the whole university benefits. It's that sort of mindset, right? So you're having people like Jim Harbaugh at Michigan, you're having people like Nick Saban, like Coach Shashevsky, um, Coach Calipari have these massive contracts. And what happens to that second tier of coaches and the third tier of coaches and the fourth tier of coaches, right? If, if I want Seton Hall basketball to become a powerhouse, I have to now compete with Coach Krzyzewski for top talent, which means that I have to figure out a way to divert a recruit to North Jersey instead of going down to Durham um, to play at Duke. It's insane because they're the highest paid state employees in most of the states in the country. Mm -hmm. Like you have top top medical researching doctors that literally cure cancer on a daily basis that don't make a fraction of what these coaches make. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, like you have a lot of guaranteed contracts. So there was a coach, Charlie Weiss, uh, famous Notre Dame coach who did really well, got this massive contract. It was like an eight or 10 year contract and tanked and got paid out a massive, massive salary. I mean, yeah. in the tens of millions of dollars because they, they signed this, this guaranteed contract, went to Kentucky or not, uh, to Kansas, signed another contract, didn't do it there, and they've been paying them out there too. So it's... Yeah. I feel like it parallels CEO compensation in America where CEOs are making ludicrous amounts of money compared to the average employee. And they get all these bonuses even though even if their company fails. Like look at Toys R Us, for example. They're... They literally shut like all their business stores shuttered, but the the owners just got like these big compensations, even though their their entire business model failed. Yeah, so I think it's it's yeah it's it's ridiculous. It, it, like you said, it, it could be it's a culture shift that could that could still ha it could happen twenty years from now that we look back and we say yeah like we have to we have to prioritize not the coaches and or the administrators, but actually just the student athletes and make changes there. So it seems like something that's kind of halting that it was kind of like the APR metric that you cited. Tell me where that went wrong, because I feel like, I feel like it's intentions were good, but just intentions themselves don't always mean that the outcomes are going to be great. So right. like where, where did the APR metric fall short? Maybe you can go describe it. A little yeah. Bit. Yeah, from its inception. I mean, from, it was flawed from its inception, to be very transparent. Where are the schools that are getting dinged the most in this? They're the schools that have the greatest populations of Black and Brown students, right? And those are HBCUs. And you even say, like, Chicago State has been dinged by this. They have a great, significant population of Black and Brown students. And so it was flawed from the start because the reality is resources matter, right? Resources play a difference and resources play a role in making this thing work. And my, my dissertation really sought to look at how resources impact those outcomes. Look at the staff at, you know, like go to any major school, go to Alabama, go to Michigan, go to University of Wisconsin, go to any and look at their staff support groups for student athletes. There will be on those on those team or on those schools upwards of 20, 25, sometimes 30 academic advisors, 10, 15 learning specialists, tutors galore, beautiful academic centers. And then you look at what what the resource level is at an historically black college, and you may have one uh, you may have one advisor for 500 student athletes, or you may have two, and they're not compensated fairly. Um, because this, the university just can't because they're struggling financially. Yeah. And this goes back into a history of, um, of states defaulting and really uh, not, not coming through on the, on the allocations for funding at the state level for historically black colleges. I mean, this is a systemic issue that we see the, the symptoms of 
But the reality is, I mean, this has been going on for a long time in terms of historically black colleges not getting the funding that they need. Whereas the flagship universities that are predominantly white absolutely get that funding at the state level. Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna stop you there. So it's so basically what you're saying is that HBCUs, the resources aren't there for them to academically do as well as the predominantly white institutions. And this APR metric kind of penalizes um, those institutions because, because number one, you can't just say, okay, um, everyone's on an equal footing because there's no equal footing and then say, all right, you guys should be doing just as good or have the same standard of met, like the same measurements. So is that kind of like what you're, you're getting? Yeah, at? that's, that's part of it. I, I mean, I, I think that's a big part of it. I think the other part of it is you have to look at the mission of the HBCU, right? The, 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 the admission standards for a lot of those schools are open access, meaning that you have a certain SAT level and you have a certain GPA and you graduate from high school. If you apply, you will be accepted. Mm -hmm. The mission of the HBCU is to educate black at, black Americans that are mm -hmm. coming from lower SES um, populations. Oftentimes, that's a big part of their, their pitches to try to educate those black Americans, as well as um, students who are first generation, meaning mom or dad did not graduate from college. And so what you see is the mission when it comes down to race, when we're looking at, and this is what my dissertation found, when we're looking at predominantly white institutions that spend about the same amount per student athlete, and sometimes those predominantly white institutions spend less than historically black colleges versus the black, historically black colleges mission, right? They, those students need more support. They just need more support because oftentimes those students will have to stop out to go home and work and, and support the family, right? They may have to stop out because they just don't have the funds to support a college education at that time. And so it may take them six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years to graduate undergraduate because they consistently stop out. It doesn't work with the metrics that the federal government or the NCA works with, which is graduating in a five or six year rate. Mm -hmm. And when you have a program that's out there to slap you on the wrist every time you don't meet a certain standard, this program is, is, is really set up to just focus on the have nots versus the haves. And I think what has become an alarming issue, um, which is something that we're not talking about a lot right now, is there's a new program called the Academic Based Revenue Distribution that the NCAA has put forth, which gives money and gives funds to the, the highest achieving. It's an incentive, right? Mm -hmm. Right. It gives it gives funds to the to the schools that can meet a certain metric, a single year metric of the APR, the GSR, or the federal graduation rate. And the reality with this is that it's giving money to the wealthiest institutions because they can provide the support for those students. So if you look at it, and I don't know if this is the original intent of the question, but the biggest structural flaw with the way that the NCA is going about running this program is it operates on equality, right? We're starting you all at the same point. Yeah, the same thing. Everybody gets the same opportunities and it just doesn't work that way. Yeah. In a situation like this, if the greatest goal is graduation, you have to focus on equity. There is no other way about it. This is a great topic because I'm learning about hospitals having incentive structures, um, incentive payment structures that um, say something along the lines of, if you have less readmission rates, if your if your population, you know, if you're not, if your readmission rates being criteria for success, guess what happens when a hospital in a black and brown community is compared to a hospital in a, a white community? The <laughs> you're going to have more readmission rates in the minority community. So this hospital is going to get paid a lot less money or get penalized. That's a very dumbed down example, but that's just one example of like, oh, we're going to incentivize these hospitals. You're going to make more money if you have lower readmission rates, but guess what? There's a healthcare disparity amongst um, it's, it's set up. People. It's set up to, to, to operate that. It's set up for certain schools to fail. It's set, it's set up for certain hospitals to fail. Yeah, I think there is a quote by, um, I think LBJ, Lyndon B. Johnson, you can't ask a person to win the race when they have, when they just were literally shackled or like chained up for 200 years when like they've been deprived of so many things like education, um, good quality healthcare and expect them to succeed. And, and that was kind of the premise for a, a lot of his social programs in, in terms of, you know, like helping diversify 
institutions. I think maybe you can help me out here for like minorities to kind of oh, get affirmative action. Oh, thank you. Yes, affirmative yeah. action. That was kind of the premise for affirmative action to happen because you can't really, you don't have, you don't have equality yet. You don't have, right. even today, even like 50 years is, that that's not nothing at all. My grandma was born in a time where interracial marriage wasn't a thing, where there was still some separate but equal policy. So yeah, affirmative action was a good step that you have to, in a sense, discriminate because there's no equality. I think that that's a huge thing that you're hitting. And it seems like the NCAA for some reason, unfortunately, maybe it'd be administrative, just um, ignorance or not really understanding that piece of it. I, I hope it's just ignorance and not like blatant, you know, like mal like malfeasance there. But yeah, it seems like on paper things, these things look great. And and they're, they're saying, all right, pick yourself up by the bootstrap, but it just does not work that way unless you have like the, like the support structure there, the resources there, the funding there from the state level, from the federal government. I want to go over with the audience what the APR metric um, penalties are because I feel like that's important and how they affect HBCUs or any school that is sanctioned. So you mentioned in your dissertation that there's level one offenses if you, you know, for schools that don't meet their metric that practice times are decreased from 20 hours to 16 hours, um, four hours of that subtraction is then allocated to academics for, I guess, studying or making sure that their um, the state athletes um, boost up their grades. And there's also public reprimand, I guess, public reprimand, reprimand would be just telling um, the student athletes that this is happening and we need to, we need to, we're, we're in level one sanctioned territory. And then level two, it says there's more reductions in competition time as well is also reduced. And then level three is more serious. There's coaching suspensions, financial aid, aid restrictions and sanctions on um, yeah, scholarships for student athletes. So, um, yeah, I feel like, because I think you said almost all sanctions or like 90% of sanctions were like specifically towards HBCUs. So it's amazing because think about it, like these are scholarship reductions for like, for black and black student athletes for less money going towards coaching and also, um, less competition time. And you also mentioned there being less revenue from these games too. And also the bad publicity from these things actually draw in less black student athletes from high school to go to these institutions. So that kind of, you mentioned earlier that there was more top um, athletes going to HBCUs that there would be a whole change, but it seems like this metric um, is kind of making that harder because then there's bad publicity athletes don't, want, don't really want to go to HBCUs because, hey, their competition times are getting restricted. Does that sound right to you, kind of like what you were getting to in your dissertation? It, it sounds spot on. Yeah. I mean, it's the, those those sanctions are harmful to, in general. They're harmful to, you know, and, and it's harmful for a number of reasons. I think the major reason is stigma, <laughs> right? And what you've noticed is that there is a whole stigma around an HBCU education as it potentially being like that's the perception because if these schools are not being successful in keeping their student athletes eligible then they must have a, a lesser quality of education you look at the benefits of attending an hbcu if you're a black american versus attending a predominantly white institution your health longevity is longer your your um your career earnings are higher right your I mean, the number of advanced degrees that are granted are much higher at HBCUs than they are at, um, at predominantly white institutions for Black Americans. We have roughly 80% of our Black doctors in America, our Black physicians, coming from two, phys two institutions, Howard's and Meharry Institute, or Meharry Medical College, two. Oh. Roughly 80% of them are coming from two institutions. But I, like the, the the benefits of an HBCU education are incredible for, you know, like if you look at Ta-Nehisi Coates and what he wrote, um, he calls uh, the yard at Howard the Mecca. Sorry, I stopped here because of a technical difficulty. So let's talk a little bit about your experience and your um, own experience as a academic advisor at Scene Hall, your experience at NYU, and we can finish off in that personal, sure. because yeah. I, I feel like personal experience brings things down to earth. Mm -hmm. So it seemed like you were submitting data for the APR, so metrics from Seton Hall University to the NCAA, 
Um, was this like a yearly thing? What kind, what kind, what kind of? Yeah, so, so every school does it on a semester basis. Okay. You have to submit data for, um, to essentially to certify somebody eligible. Essentially like, our, you know, our office, I wasn't personally submitting it, but our office is charged with submitting the annual score to the NCA every year for the NCA to interpret. Mm -hmm. So we would do what every year, you know, at the end of each semester and the beginning of each semester, and beginning, depending on how you're looking at it, is we would certify all students for, for eligibility. So we were making sure that at division one, after two semesters, you had met 40% of your degree, that you were, um, that you were averaging, you know, essentially 12 credits a semester, mm -hmm. um, that you were on pace, you were declared a major after, you know, after six semesters, you had completed 60% of your degree after, after eight, you had completed 80% of your degree. And, and so that was part of my job. I actually enjoyed doing it because it was, it made me intentional as an advisor to make sure that, Hey, I, Oh, I noticed that Bryant is missing this course. I want to make sure that I talk to him to make sure that he stays on track with his degree. And so I think the nature of the process was helpful because it was accountability metric for a lot of time, for a lot of times we had the bandwidth to be able to do that. Right. We had a, a, a staff that was well, you know, that, um, that had been doing work for many years. You know, I was the, 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 the newest to the staff. We had a great, mm -hmm. a great team there that had been doing the work and knew the university very well and knew what we had to do to prioritize student athletes making progress and earning their degree. You don't have that everywhere. Um, you know, oftentimes you have such high turnover that somebody may be brand new to the industry and starting and they're in charge of making all the decisions. And it's just not fair to hold people to different standards when it comes to that. Yeah, yeah. I, it seemed like you had a good cohesive. I think it was just, was it three people that were serving. Yeah, it was three three full time. We had three full time and two two grads. Okay, and two grad students. Okay, nice. Are you all, so right now at NYU? Are you also a compliance officer? Yep. Give me like kind of a summary of what you're doing. Yeah, so we we do a little bit of everything. I mean, we're we're charged with providing data to the NCA. The the Division three has a similar program as the APR um, that we provide data to the NCA on, um, you know, it's, we also monitor rosters. We do all the, the focus on um, certifying students eligibility and monitoring rosters and making sure that everybody's doing what they need to do. Mm -hmm. Students have questions about whatever it might be, if they're a model or if they're coaching somewhere, you know, hey, I got an offer to coach at my high school. What does that mean for me? Yeah. Or, you know, like uh, Chick-fil-A wants me to, <laughs> to start in their next commercial. Can I do it? Um, we help them with those sort of things. Okay. Nice. So yeah, could continue doing the, the work that, that you've been doing. I feel like, especially coming off the heels of a um, massive protest last year and this pandemic, I feel like this is an interesting century, interesting whatever like, like decade that we're going to come into. I look forward to keeping up with you. Hopefully you break a five minute mile. Appreciate that, Brian. And I, it was good. It was enlightening to really hear from you about um, about this topic. I'm so cool. Brian. To help me to talk. <laughs> happy to talk. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for talking about um, your dissertation with me and kind of like informing me more about what's going on at the NCAA level. It means a lot. So maybe I'll have you again in the future. Awesome. Would love it. <laughs> All right. Take care. Then I'll see you maybe next time.